Um, there we go. Just some uh, housekeeping. We're not going to use the podium. We want to make this as conversational as possible and, and, and answer as many of your questions as possible. Um, the uh, gentleman to my right is Ed Zadowski, and uh, he is the Vice President of IT for Circle K North America, and he works within a global organization that literally has stores around the globe. As you know, Circle K has been very acquisitive. Uh, Ed's background, though, is incredibly unique because he's, he's worked with a large corporation on the QSR side of the business that is well known for its, its uh, data innovation and its operational excellence. And so we're going to get a lot of insights, not only from a large organization within the convenience space, but from his history with those guys that had a, have a clown and, and the Hamburglar as a, as a um, uh, brand uh, ambassadors. Um, after this session, we're supposed to kind of tell you what we're going to talk about. After this session, we're hoping that you can envision the innovations that are going to be occurring in our business space over the next five years. So we've got what I call the shiny object slide, which we'll talk about some of the stuff that's being developed in the industry and is going to be coming to the marketplace that we're seeing on the horizon. Understand the technology platform, though, and the enhancements that must be considered. Last year, we just talked about technologies driving some of these innovations. We had a hard stop where we said, well, wait a minute. Um, we actually need to have some fundamental piping and um, architectural changes for us to even consider being able to do um, the majority of these things. Understand the cultural changes. And if you ever heard Vish Apathy, he's the CIO, or the chief technology officer of Accenture Retail. He has one really great quote, which is, the technology is easy, but culture is not. And so for all of our technology, we have to understand how the organization needs to change, and in fact, organizational structures to support the stuff that we're going to talk about here today. So if you were here yesterday uh, for uh, the morning sessions, I apologize, but I want to refresh this and bring us back to why we're talking about all this stuff. Uh, at the core of this is the consumer-centric view that they have better AI kung fu than we do. Why? Because consumers have been lured onto Apple and Google platforms. And they are now on those platforms that links them 100% of the time. And if you think about uh, you know, going to a bar and doing a, uh, a trivia contest today, you know, it used to be people actually had to know this stuff. Now it's just who can Google it fast enough and the guy who's got voice recognition on his phone is doing it just like this. Um, the consumer has got amazing amounts of power in their hand. And that's really because it's following and also shaping what the consumer uh, expectations are in a frictionless lifestyle. Um, whether it's really giving us more time, I don't know. Um, but it's certainly giving us a lot more information on demand and when we want it. The disruptors that we see out there are seeking legacy markets as an opportunity, especially big pools of, of sales that have been around for a long time and have embedded hidebound legacy systems of operations and traditions. That's where a disruptor wants to come in and basically take market share. And we could do an entire hour on how disruptors operate, but just think in terms of Airbnb, the biggest hotel chain without one piece of property, or Uber, the biggest cab company, audacious companies. Every business is in the convenience business. As you walked over here today, you went by a CVS kiosk and you went by a Best Buy kiosk. That's their convenience offer. If you want something out of the Best Buy, uh, they've got the most, the highest selling or highest demand items sitting in that kiosk that you can that you can purchase. And CVS has got all the patent medicines that you could possibly want as you're as you're in the trade show. So they're projecting their stores out into non-traditional spaces. If you walk into Japan, you'll see a family mart that's 5,000 square feet, and then at a train station, you'll see a family mart that's only 200 square feet. And what they're doing there is they're projecting those highest value items at the time for the convenience of the customer. Challenge you to name one business that is not in the convenience business. And as I mentioned yesterday, the Wall Street Journal had an article on convenience retail, and it didn't mention convenience stores once. Okay. Uh, every business is going to be in the data business. We have cement company CEOs on record saying we are in the data business. So if you think that cement can become a data business, it can. And the whole idea is this. 
Using data makes me a more efficient and more responsive company because I'm also in the convenience business. Cement companies are trying to figure out how they can deliver cement much faster than call, wait for the truck, pour, and repeat. They want to have the truck out there when the people need it at the exact same time. That's why they're in the data business, because they're conveniently providing cement. Scale is rentable. And this is a great, a great message for a small operator in our business. Everything we're going to talk about today is pretty much within reach of some of the smallest chains. And then individual site operator may have some trouble for this, some of this stuff. But if you were here yesterday for the 9 o'clock session, we had Circle K, and we had Loop, and we had Quick Check stores. So we had 25 and 45 store chains that were talking about doing self-checkout, mobile self-checkout, we're doing loyalty programs, we're doing ACH at the pump authorizations, doing wildly innovative things. And it's because this scale is now rentable. You do not have to be the biggest guy in the block to do a lot of these things. And then the other thing is we need to embrace the, internet, uh, the Industrial Revolution 4.0. It's gonna erode location and immediacy as moats. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what's happening in China along those lines. This is McKinsey's view in January of 2019. It's very simply this. Uh, consumers have sky high expectations. If you want to see expectations, go talk to the kid living in your house, your teenagers. They absolutely believe that everything can be delivered in the, in the moment, and I don't have to worry about payments because it's on my phone. But the thing is, is that we have to ensure a convenient and frictionless environment. And it's not just at the checkout. We really do one thing, and it hasn't changed since 1959. We sell time, we don't sell Twinkies. And so think in terms of how can I help my consumer have a frictionless life, not just a frictionless store experience. The other thing you have to remember is that friction comes in, people have different perspectives uh, with, uh, with friction. I go to a Wegmans because I like to interact with the store. They do a great job of, show, of showcasing the store. For them not to do that is friction to me, all right? So I like that friction. I like the friction of, of looking and exploring. So not all exploring and not all customer experience, dwell time in the store creates friction. Some of it creates a lot of brand affiliation. And it's not about the physical retail space anymore as well. Um, in fact, think outside of the box. We all sell uh, the same 3,500 items, smokes, cokes, and gasoline. Um, how can I project, how can I put more virtual items in my store, and how can I project those, those items out into a wider trading area than just the people who are driving by my store? If you believe the location is important, just think about what Waze is doing to neighborhoods in Los Angeles. People were buying locations on the heavy streets, and Waze is directing them to side streets so they can, they can skip all the traffic. So all the people who invested in that heavy traffic location, you're now all seeing it go, going down a two-lane in a neighborhood. So it will change the way that we look at locations. So I want to talk a little bit about Alibaba. Um, again, we, did, we talked about this yesterday, but Alibaba's whole theory, start from scratch theory, is automate all operating decisions. And that should, you should wake up with that every morning. And this is going to feed into a lot of things that we're going to be discussing. Um, sometimes, there we go. Starts with datafying every customer exchange, every data interaction, whether it's on the phone, whether it's in face-to-face -face in a point, uh, point to point, or if it's even at the fuel pump. But the whole idea is to capture the customer experience in lo your location. Data is king. I'm sure you've heard this. The amount of data we're going to be storing and transmitting is going to go up five-fold over the next five to ten years. And it's going to be driven by us datafying reality and trying to bring it into a data structure that we can then go back and analyze as we go forward. You want to software every activity. So where there is repetitive tasks uh, that are prone to different levels of service, a machine can provide the same level of service, especially if it's augmenting a human being. That's where you want to software the, that activity. You want to automate it. You want to get the data flowing. It's no longer credible to keep your data inside and have your merchandising guys look at it while they're talking to their vendors. The best operators in this industry are sharing that data with their vendors. And they're partnering with their vendors and saying, how can we help each other sell more of your stuff through my store because we both benefit? It's a very different business relationship. And then later, it's apply the algorithms. And last year, I think I was a little bit too, uh, too prone to saying, hey, AI is right around the corner. And I guess my message changed this year is, 
uh, AI is a long way away. We don't have enough data to make AI really worthwhile. Our tasks have changed. And while a lot of things we're gonna look at have pulled in, what we need to start thinking about is how do I datafy every activity within the store? And every piece of data has future value. So when Alibaba does this, they went from 2014, a $5 billion EBITDA that grew to $15.5 billion in EBITDA over the next three years or four years. So that's a fairly significant growth. And in fact, if you take a look at the world's most valuable companies, um, I believe that JP Morgan now is the only non-technology or data-driven company. And I would argue that JP Morgan is a data-driven company, but all of the tech companies populate the top 10 most valuable companies in the world. Exxon just got dropped off the list. So data is king. All right, I also talk to CEOs. And uh, I, get the, I get the opportunity to talk to CEOs at CEO forums with Nax and also the strategy conferences. And we have the opportunity to have some deep conversations. And the important thing is, is that the new generation of CEOs grew up with video games. They grew up with technology. The oldest one of them had a Commodore 64 back in the, in the 80s, right? So these guys have been playing with this stuff for a while, and they understand that technology is a given. They have watched their generation grow up with it, and they've watched their generation adopt it. What really keeps them awake at night is this. How do we keep pace? They understand intrinsically that somebody can come in, find a chink in my armor, and interrupt and disrupt us very, very quickly. And you know what? We couldn't even do that innovation project last year on time and on budget. So how are we gonna to respond to a disruption? How do we get agility without ripping out everything from the roots? How do we add life into our sunk costs? Because we've got a lot of systems that do what they were meant to do very well, even though they're very antiquated, not architecturally up to speed. And then they're also looking at risk in a new way. You know, we've always bought fire insurance. Uh, we're starting to buy data security insurance. But these, these guys are looking forward from a business perspective and saying, what is the risk of somebody coming in and disrupting my business model? If you talk to the Sheets people, they have a full-time staff that does nothing but come to work every morning with the task of, how would you put Sheets out of business? They think about it that much, okay? So one of the keys we've teased out, evaluate and adopt 4 ARR, uh, develop digital culture and organizations. There's that culture thing again. It's not just about buying fancy new stuff. It's about getting all your people up to speed and then out innovating potential competitors. And that is a strategic mindset. Ten, 10 years out, who can disrupt us? Why? What do we need to do now working backwards to make sure that that risk goes away and goes to zero? So let's go through the shiny object stack. Uh, yesterday, I just showed a, a picture of the final stack. Here is our traditional system where we've got a very linear data flow that goes from the forecourt and the payment systems through the checkout to the back office and up to the headquarters. And this is usually a batch-based function. Um, I push my price changes down in a batch. I pull up all my uh, day end reports in a batch and then we process, unless there's of course an emergency price change, which we all have to live through. What's happening today is that we are projecting this store into the mobile space and we're doing it um, you know, kind of tentatively, but we're starting to, to get every operator looking at some level of how do I push the store out into the mobile space? We certainly have got loyalty. We've got a lot of loyalty uh, companies that are out there. We've got customers using loyalty in a mix and match fashion at the point of sale. Um, payments uh, was really pioneered by Cumberland Farms with ACH. Um, they now have about 20% of their customer base is using the smart pay application at the pump. They've shifted market share with that. Um, now we're starting to see promotion of mobile checkout, and those are very nascent technologies. But the, the mobile checkout is really, uh, it's now pushed across most of the 7-Elevens. They're, they're rolling that out. It's been very successful for them. And we've got a lot of smaller and medium-sized operators who are also rolling out their own mobile checkout where a customer who only needs one item can walk in the store, scan it, and walk out of the store after paying for it. So it, serves, it, it doesn't serve all of our customers, it serves a specific use case of friction for that customer who tomorrow may want to come in and buy five items and doesn't mind waiting in line to do that, okay? All right, the other thing that we're seeing is more and more cloud services coming to us. So this is the, this is the, the abstraction that we're gonna be really kind of focusing on. Um, delivery integration. Right now, delivery integration sucks. 
we have a whole set of screens in the back door and we have a human being going up reading the order off and putting it into our production system and then fulfilling the delivery. Um, we're going to see a lot more IoT plant management, and we're going to see more of that stuff moving into our food services locations. We're going to start measuring temperatures along the production chain because we know food safety is a very big issue for us. We need to make sure that cold places stay cold. We need to make sure that hot places stay hot and that food is prepared right. You're going to see AI checkout. That's not really the first use case for mobile. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. You're also going to see POS in the cloud, and everybody's going, oh, wow, yeah, POS in the cloud. I can't even get HBO in Six Sigma. Um, but POS in the cloud offers a lot of things that we'll talk about down the road is the ability to move incremental improvements in the site out there much quicker because you're not moving it out to a site and then uploading a new update. The other thing is, and I think you'll touch on this, there's some real economic ROI for moving, removing a lot of hardware. Uh, home shopping and delivery. This is an extension coming out of mobile checkout. Now, obviously, you've got the click and collect dudes, Walmart, Target, and so forth, who have got their stores pretty much virtualized on a mobile device or a desktop device. But we need to start doing that as well. So think in terms of this. If your trading area of a store is really the thoroughfare along a major artery and only the people who pass by you, by having this digital checkout and then marrying it even with home delivery, I now could project myself to three miles from the store in a, in a circle. I don't have to worry about traffic patterns anymore on the most convenient store. So think in terms of instead of having 3,200 people around a traditional convenience store, which is the average today, I literally could project it and appeal to 10,000 people in that store. And those incremental uh, sales that I pick up are dropping to the bottom line at 15%. All the stuff that's making this happen Yes, we can do nice ASCII, you know, batch-based interfaces with our legacy systems. But the thing is, is we need APIs to make this work, all right? We're not going to rip out our points of sale and then go with something brand new and untested so that we can do mobile self-checkout. So APIs become a fundamental thing. The other thing that we're going to see a lot of is robotic process automation. And I don't want, we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but this is one of those low-hanging fruits that if you adopt this in your, in your environment, you can get some real ROI short-term benefits. Okay, two to five years. Um, remember I said data was gonna be uh, quadrupling, quintupling? It's not that you're gonna be doing more transactions out of your BI stack. What's gonna happen is, is that we now need to start wrapping some context around what my sales were doing, and that's really gonna be your IoT web events. DTN's prepared to tell you what your hourly weather was per store by geocode. They've got that data today. They provide that to the financial markets. The Wall Street Journal or, or uh, Dow Jones News is prepared to give you news that's happening within that geocode. So you know, okay, was there an accident in I-5 that caused my sales to go down? So there's, those people are out there. You don't even have to screen scrape it. 30,000 news sources for DTN or uh, Dow Jones. So that is going to get more and more intense and that data is gonna come in and it's gonna give you context so that you can recreate what the reality was at that store last year so I can better predict what I'm gonna be doing this year going forward. Um, then four plus years. And I'm gonna say the big change that we have here, that used to be seven plus years last year. We basically have added some things and we pulled it in about three years. All right, so um, one thing that pulled up very quickly was blockchain. We'll talk about blockchain. Autonomous vehicle delivery, we, ha we won't be talking about much more down the line. But think of this. There are billions of dollars being invested in middle mile and last mile autonomous delivery. Elon Musk gets all the, gets all the news for driverless cars. Think in terms of that of being 10 to 20 years away. But Walmart is investing heavily in what we call middle mile. How do I get from my, my DC to a Walmart store so at Christmas time, I don't have to stack up the shipping containers outside to meet demand? From our perspective, we need to start thinking in terms of how does McLean stop driving a 52-foot truck to my store once a week? How do they start driving an autonomous vehicle to my store every day with fresh produce in it so that my lettuce doesn't look really hairy by the end of the week? Because I need to get in the fresh and, and fast business. So we need to start re rethinking that. And we're not the only ones. Chick-fil-A is rethinking this as well. Their, their challenge is they either need to build more cooler space or get more, more frequent deliveries. So everybody in the food business is dealing with this. So that's gonna come fairly, fairly quickly. 
The other thing is they don't have the, they don't need Star Wars technology. They are under 30 miles an hour. They're not carrying a human being and they don't have to pass the same stringent safety stuff that a vehicle that's autonomous is driving a human being at high rates of speed. Predictive analytics will start coming in and it's gonna come in not from an AI perspective, it's gonna come in from a deep statistics perspective. Never confuse the two. <clears throat> I'm still gratified to see that I haven't seen AI on one booth yet out there on the show floor. You go to the NRF show, even the bathrooms say artificially intelligent, all right? Uh, it's the bud buzzword that's coming down, and I think if you talk to anybody who's looked at it, what we really are at right now because of the data set is pretty narrow is deep statistics, and that's got a lot of value, so don't undervalue the deep math. So our challenges to all this stuff, and this is what made us put the brakes on, or at least tap the brakes, is our legacy systems of record. They're really designed for normal business of today, but really yesterday, right? Inflexible data flows, if you look across the enterprise, um, most of this stuff is being proprietarily pushed from system to system or it's hard-coded systems to system and we can't exfiltrate it. So if you have to go in and get access to a price book because your digital scanner needs to have access to the price book, you have a you bring your own device type of scan out system, uh, it's very difficult to get that price book out of the system because it wasn't designed to do that that way. We have inconsistent data structures and so if you're trying to build a data lake, it's all over the place. The enterprise data visibility is really limited to those who are getting management exception reports, and that's about it, but other people need to see it. Uh, but they do a really good job, and so think in terms of if you want to benchmark somebody, go look what the banks did. The banks had regulatory systems in place since the 80s, programmed in COBOL, still running off of punch cards, and they're still there, even though Capital One and JP Morgan have these really cool mobile apps. What they did is they put in APIs that make those great systems of record work. Here's another scary thing. Air traffic control still uses the borough systems from 1973, all right? Because they haven't been able to figure out one that does it better. And that's the way we need to think. If it's working, let's make it work better, faster, and cheaper. Culturally and financially, by the way, pulling that stuff out is, is, is a dead end. We, then we get to our store systems. And um, it's designed for oil and franchise, by and large, unless you are a private brand and are not in part of one of the, one of the brand uh, environments. And so what that really means, if it's in the oil business, is it's selling that thing called gasoline or oil or, or diesel, and that's all it really is intended to do. And they want it to do it in a very secure way because they have to comply with PCI, and it's their credit card network and their brand cards that are going through that. So basically, they're locking down the system just at the t and they have to, just at the time that we need these systems to open up because we want to do other stuff, all right? They're designed for today's normal, and we need to start thinking about what is tomorrow's exceptions and how do we redesign those. So our current state's really kind of dire. Innovation's expensive and laborious. Test and learn severely, we don't do that. Response to disruption is gonna be feeble at best. Our tech stack is expensive to maintain and all the AI benefits that we've talked about last year are gonna remain elusive until we make some changes. So with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed to walk us through some, some key trends that we see. For the retailers in the room, anybody overwhelmed? by that picture. I, I'm a big retailer and, and I can tell you Circle K is overwhelmed with that picture. There's a lot of stuff on there and I can tell you the timelines that you saw are, are, are probably conservative. This stuff is staring us in the face today. You know, and, and, and my advice to you and, and what we're doing at Circle K is uh, don't try to boil the ocean on that. There are some places where you can make small bets, get quick wins uh, and start to implement some of this stuff now thinking about shift to cloud. Uh, we're gonna go through some of those things here, but look for those places to get started on the journey. Uh, for the tech suppliers in the room, anybody overwhelmed by that? Hopefully you're excited. But to think about it, you've got some cool stuff that you can do that's gotta integrate with old legacy platforms. And we've got a whole heck of a lot of data problems underneath that. So uh, the journey is exciting, uh, but a little scary at the same time. So let's talk about some of the things you can do today um, get your data house in order you know for us we've grown quickly through merger and acquisition and one of our biggest opportunities is disparate data sets uh, so master data management and data governance is key uh, you can't do good analytics you're not going to do any kind of rpa or artificial intelligence without good data storage is cheap so collect everything you can put it into bob's storage uh, when when you get to that point of using it for artificial intelligence uh, it'll be incredibly valuable to you constantly look for more not, not only look at the data that's within your organization, but what are the, what are the data sets you can augment with 
whether it's government data, weather data, traffic data, uh, there's a ton of stuff out there that's easy. Uh, get it structured. Um, and, and Gray and the team are working on our behalf. He's going to talk a little bit about what does a data dictionary mean? How can you get started on this journey today? And, and where is, is Connexus driving some of the standards on this? Yeah, we, the way we look at a data dictionary, which, which is really kind of a boring term, right? Because nobody even uses a dictionary today. <laughs> um, we are looking to define those data points within an enterprise so that we can take the reality and digitize it into a meaningful data point that later on we can do it. So we're, we're doing nothing less than defining the taxonomy of our business language and operations language. It's going to be a long road to hoe. If you only use one thing from, from Connexus down the road, standardizing in a data dictionary will make your, your, even your bespoke projects go a lot faster. Make it accessible. Greg talked a little bit about it before. Uh, access for our vendors, for our suppliers. You can even commoditize this, but get it uh, organized and make it accessible. Uh, this is my favorite slide. I can talk about this one forever. Um, Gray mentioned, I, I, you know, I'm kind of new to the industry, a little less than two years. Uh, I come from McDonald's where, where I think McDonald's did transformation about as good as anybody else could have done it. Uh, so a lot of my experience is relevant there, so I'll weave some of those in. But I, I like to say today in our industry, in, 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 the, in the retail industry, the POS is the most important part of our tech equation. And it needs to be the least important part. It's an input. A kiosk is an input. A connected car is an input. A sensor in the, in the ceiling is an input. A camera is an input. Uh, it, it's unlimited POS devices in, in the customer's hands, the way they want to use it, when they want to use it, how they want to use it. So we've got to start to think about it that way. Um, Ad hoc price book connections is, is going to be critical. So as you think about now adding on new applications, whether it's digital menu boards, uh, a, a delivery app, a mobile application, having a price book feed that feeds all these extra POS endpoints is critical. Accurate inventory is a must. So as you think about uh, home delivery now, a customer needs to know what's in your store and what's available. Uh, I, I've played around with Circle K is doing a little pilot with a thing called Flavor in Texas. Uh, I had beer delivered to the hotel and I, I put an order in. Uh, it wasn't available in the store. So what is that operations interaction now? How does that driver, that, that the associate, interact back with me to say, we've got to offer an alternative? Uh, and then virtualizing store and screen mode. So if you think about digital channels now, how do they look and feel consistent? So I like to use the McDonald's example. If you go to the mobile app, does it look and feel like the kiosk? Does it look and feel like the drive through menu board? Does it look like the menu board over the front counter? You got to think about this content now being shared across multi-channel. Food orders injected directly into the kitchen is a, is a big deal. This is something I think we got lucky with at McDonald's a number of years ago. We experimented with a call center. So you pull up to the drive through there's somebody in a remote center taking an order and pumping it back into the POS. Uh, we called it foreign order injection, but that API became useful down the road when we started injecting orders through mobile applications, through kiosk, and now through home delivery. Uh, we all need that API in organizations because these things are coming at us. So what are you doing to think about how foreign order uh, food orders get injected directly into your POS. And then payment push to store. I sit on a board, a tech forum for the Merchant Advisory Group who advocates on behalf of all of us for payment standards uh, and low rates in the industry. And, and I had the opportunity to, to have a chat with a guy from Best Buy uh, a week and a half ago. And he said, payment's a service. You know, it's not something that inherently exists in the store. There are multiple ways to get payment. And if I'm a POS, I need to make a call to say, I got to acquire some money. How do I get that? Let the payment service, the cloud service, figure out the best way to do that, the cheapest way to process it, the fastest way to get it back to the store. And then delivery integration. Uh, you're probably all thinking about some form of, of Uber Eats or DoorDash or Grubhub. Uh, you don't want to have nine tablets on your, on your counter sitting next to your POS. So what does that integration look like? Uh, what are the APIs that are there? What are the automatic price feeds? And again, that, that order injection piece coming back. IoT is here. So uh, I, I think we're all looking at what can we do with cameras in the stores. They're not just for uh, video surveillance anymore. You can stick AI into the camera, you can stick AI behind the camera, and you can do a whole bunch of things with it. Uh, but what is the standard? You know, this, this stuff is cheap. We're thinking about it from we've got cameras that can do surveillance, we, that can do inventory management, that can do artificial intelligence. I don't want to have three different cameras solutions in the store. It's the what is the camera strategy? that's going to allow me to use multiple use cases on top of it. Mm -hmm. And this stuff is cheap. Uh, inventory, you know, there are multiple use cases for this. This stuff exists today. So inventory management, just looking at cycle counts. Walmart's got robots going up and down the roads, checking inventory. 
and sending automatic feeds back to say, here's what we need to restock, here's what we need to reorder. Uh, they've got use cases out there for plant ground compliance. It just, a static camera can look at an entire rack and say you've got you've got the wrong thing in the wrong place. Uh, down to you got the wrong price on, on a particular item. Uh, promotion compliance. So start small with this today. The advanced uses can come later. The key is to have uh, the infrastructure in now and be prepared for the future. We, we, a colleague of mine on a panel yesterday had a great analogy. Uh, let's get the let's get the conduit poured. Let's get the conduit put in before we pour the concrete. So this is something everybody needs to be thinking about today. Uh, CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. This is, um, I, I'd say this is a, a challenge for all of us. Uh, the, the pace of, of innovation is stressing the traditional IT world. Uh, for us, uh, and for us at McDonald's, the POS deployment was always the longest pull in the tent. So we get great marketing people and great digital people that come in and say, I have a cool idea for the next mobile app, the loyalty platform, digital initiative, and they, they stop dead at the POS because uh, this thing is traditional waterfall and it's going to take anywhere from six to, eight to 18 months to deploy. So we've got to find a way to become more nimble in that space. Uh, we've got to find a way to bring Agile into that uh, with, with innovation being the driver. The big upgrades run at slower clock speeds. So for us, as we think about this, it's uh, how do we take this monolithic architecture and abstract it with a nimble layer that allows us to be allows it to have speed to market. And, and you saw in the Gray's roadmap uh, APIs, and that API gateway is the thing that gets us there. We've got to change the way we work. So uh, if we're, we're talking about microservices today, I, I mentioned payment as a service. Uh, ordering should be a service. The pause is just a, a, a thin client application that is serving up these things based on a consumer need or a cashier need at the time. So we're thinking about microservices. I like to say that, uh, for, you know, in my world, I've got uh, an NCR and Verifone point of sale system plus a, a few others. It shouldn't matter what hardware is on the counter. It shouldn't matter what software is at the endpoint. It's what is that abstraction layer, that business service layer, that API driven architecture that allows us to mask all of those pieces and connect out to the services that we need. So when, when you know, David uh, Zell mentioned yesterday that Amazon ripped up their monolithic architecture in 2005 and then went to a more nimble. And <clears throat> the term that they've coined on, on agile development is no team will be bigger than two pizzas at lunch, the two pizza team. So we think about next level tools. RPA isn't something to be intimidated by. Uh, it is something that gets people excited. It's a new shiny object, but RPA has been around for a long time. Uh, it's a macro. You know, we were writing them in Excel, we were writing them in, in Lotus 1, 2, 3 before that. But this stuff exists today. It's just repeating simple tasks. You know, for us in, in Circle K, it's, it's how do you take a look at the reporting that happens in the accounting world and automate some of that. We can take a lot of hours out of an accountant's day uh, by processing and crunching numbers and delivering reports back for them to analyze versus spin on. Uh, and then I think the other big use case is how do you start to take administrative tasks out of the store? We know our associates are most effective in our managing the store when they're taking care of the customer, not standing in the back office trying to, to run data, to do analysis. So where, where can you leverage a basic macros or RPA to help shave administrative time out of a store? You probably have statistics in your organization about every minute saved equates to X amount of dollars. We know that statistic for us and there's high value in this piece. We're all talking artificial intelligence somewhere. We're talking to Alexa, we're talking to Siri, we're talking to Google. Uh, natural language processing is here. And, and it, it is something that we can take advantage of. It, a lot of it is open source. Uh, a lot of it is free. A lot of it is easy to plug into existing applications. Uh, Microsoft's got a whole set of cognitive services out there that will allow you to plug in voice recognition, uh, facial recognition, you know, a number of different pieces. But it's, it's here. Uh, McDonald's is experimenting it within a drive through uh, you might get your order right if you're talking to a robot versus a human. I don't know. Uh, but it's here. So uh, something that we should definitely be considering, thinking about in our industry. And, and the last one, I, I wanted to just, this is, this is probably not something most of us are, are even thinking about or talking about at this point. I know we haven't done much with it at Circle K. But it's something we can't ignore. There are some really significant use cases that I think will be game changers for us in the industry as we think about what blockchain can do. So just watching regulation, whether it's around 
uh, Juul, the, the vaping piece that's happening or the, the age limit going up in the tobacco world, uh, there is a real need for a track and trace piece that follows these, these, these devices or, or these, these um, pieces from beginning to end. We need to find a way as retailers to be uh, more diligent about keeping these out of the hands of, of underage people. And blockchain uh, is going to give us some fantastic capabilities around track and trace to make sure that uh, if these things do end up in the wrong place, we've got a whole chain that we can go back to and find out where did that come from. Um, I, this is not on the slide, but I had an opportunity to hear a guy speak at, at, at the Merchant Advisory Group last week about age verification. So blockchain's got some incredible uses there around age verification. When our customers hand over a driver's license to make an alcohol purchase, they give us a lot of information they don't want to give us or shouldn't have to give us. The driver's license number, they give us a home address, they give us a, a height, a, an eye color, a weight. Uh, when all what we need to know as a merchant, all they want to give us is, I'm over 21. Uh, blockchain's going to enable you to control your identity and deliver only the pieces of information that you want to deliver for the use case that's needed there. Anything to add on blockchain? Yeah, um, and I think you're gonna see more and more use cases on this because we're gonna get serious, I think, about the existential, uh, personal, personally identifiable information that we're passing around. Um, it really is the root of all of our breach evils. Uh, people can create synthetic personalities and, and we've gotta come up as a society, and I think the world is moving in this direction with a way of just disclosing what you need. And I think tokenization then becomes a, a big element of that. We should never put our social security number anywhere. It should be a tokenized version. So you don't see cryptocurrency on here. It, it is really about those other pieces um, that I think add value to our organizations. I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm on record as saying I think Bitcoin is stupid. Um, <laughs> nobody ever used a Rembrandt to buy a pack of cigarettes, and that's why people get Bitcoin. Um, one of the things I want to talk a little bit about, this is Porter's value chain, uh, if you're familiar at all with the, the way that Porter kind of looked at markets and, and organizations. And value chain was very highly segmented. So if you look at human resource management, that's all they really did. And you look at technology and then procurement, it's how we deliver things. And then underneath you've got the, the, the logistics side of how I bring things in and how I sell things out. And that was the value chain, the administration, administrative on top, the operational on the bottom. And the problem we run into, and I think Ed alluded to this with the marketing guys, coming down the hall saying, I got the latest, greatest way to do marketing to the consumer on a mobile device, is if they don't know anything about what our existing capabilities are on the tech stack, um, or having inputs into, hey, this is our strategy over the next five years, what we want to do for marketing, and matching that up to what IT is saying they're going to do on the tech stack, we have really a mess. And so the question is, is can an organization truly be digital with siloed technologists? And that's, that's a question we're really asking. We haven't figured that one out, but that's a question that I think everybody should be asking. Um, Ed made the point, I think, earlier to me saying, look, it's not like we're sitting there with a lot of engineers laying around the, the shop that we can now embed them in accounting and embed them in, in marketing. Um, so it's really kind of a, a knowledge spread type of thing. How do we increase the digital skill sets then across the organization? And I think you'll hear more and more about this with IR40, which is this is a big retraining thing. People are worried about losing their jobs. No, what they really need to focus on is how do I retrain myself so I know just enough about that technology that I can represent what my area of expertise is in a digital world. We don't need more computer scientists. What we need are business expertise who understand computer science and can articulate what the question is so that they can ask it of a system. How do we embed the tech roadmap within and across our cultures? My frustration as running a standards group is this. You guys come to me with a standard, but what I do know is a year before that, somebody in some other part of your organization made a decision to do something. And if we could know when that happened back then, we could have a standard ready when you're ready to roll out. And so it's just the, the, the latency in, in that whole innovation stack, and it's working against us. Yeah, you can't underestimate the importance of this piece. It's easy to talk about the tech and to start solving problems there, but without the organization to support it, uh, none of the tech works. Uh, Gray mentioned culture before. Um, the culture piece is so important here. It's, it's, it's integrating new elements that, that most organizations haven't had before. 
So you have your traditional operations, you have your traditional marketing and your traditional IT, but a digital asset, the digital resource is truly different. And, and when you embed them into the organization, it's now what do they own versus what does marketing own or, or, or what does is, what is tech own? And for us, uh, we had a significant amount of growing pains with that in, uh, in McDonald's. We're trying to uh, accelerate some of those learnings in Circle K, but this is such a critical piece to get right. With, without this, you, you don't get the products, you don't get consistent implementation, uh, execution fails. So you had mentioned something earlier when we were talking about the, uh, the conflict that, that, that there's a constructive kind of a, friction. Yeah. So tell me about that, the constructive friction. How does, how does, how do you see that as a, as a, a phase that a culture has to go through? If you look, so you look at a lot of these organizations, you mentioned the Popeye's example before, a yeah. lot of these digital people that are coming in are millennials. They're, they're a different generation, they're digital natives, they've grown up with this stuff in their hand. And they, they come into the traditional IT world where uh, we've, we've done things a certain way and waterfall methods and uh, they, they've got great ideas, they wanna move quickly uh, and they can't. Or they find a great idea and they move quickly and operations can't match it. So Gray mentioned, he, we were talking about Popeye's. They had this great marketing campaign around this chicken sandwich, uh, and they, they executed that flawlessly. They got the word out, uh, and the ops guys ran out of chicken. So this is constructive friction. If you don't have everybody at the table on sync, uh, in sync, uh, then somewhere in, in the uh, execution, it's gonna break down. Yeah, I love the Popeye's experience. My kids are still waiting for the sandwich to come back. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the API Sprint because we've talked a lot about APIs. And uh, Conexus actually two years ago realized that APIs were really the future. If you think way back in our history, we were the first organization to, uh, to adopt XML uh, since 1999. And some of us are old enough to remember that. Uh, and that served us well. It was a document uh, type with implementation guides. Um, but we were getting spotty deployment of that standard that was going on out there. The other thing that's happening is we're running out of people who, kids, millennials, who want to program and use XML as, as the, the standard core. And what they want to do is they want to be in APIs. They, they understand that everything in their hand is being API driven. All the innovation, the FinTech stuff is all API driven. So we're just making the logical upgrade to the way we work. And we're doing it on an accelerated basis. We're saying we got to get out of XML and we've got to move forward on some other stuff. Um, we believe that the microservices is the key. Remember we tapped the brakes and said, we got to think how we do this. We look at APIs quickly delivered, especially the table stakes APIs is going to give the retailer enough flexibility now to do some of this really good stuff while preserving the legacy tech stack. We'd rather have you spend money on innovation than replacing stuff that you already, that's already servicing you pretty well. Abstracts the functionality to certified APIs. Make no mistake about it, Conexus is now extending its offer. It used to be just documents of how we do things. Conexus is gonna be getting into the API business and we're gonna have a repository of very well standardized and certified APIs that you can pull down or your vendors can pull down. So the vendor, the idea is if a vendor has done one side of that API with another vendor, but a third vendor comes in and wants to connect to them, you don't have to change anything on that core vendor. You just have that other vendor do that API. Um, we think doing this abstraction is gonna give you the flexibility to do the CI, CD side of it so that instead of doing these monolithic roles, which we know, I mean, you talk to any oil company, they're right there with McDonald's. It can take upwards of 18 months to, to push that stuff out. We need to figure out how we can get incremental rolls out almost on a, on a uh, scrum basis. I test it. It's a module, I get it out in the field. It's a small package that I'm delivering and executing. Um, as I said, it's actual code with standardized and tested interfaces. So as a retailer, this is gonna give you an advantage over the XML stuff. We had some partial implementations and we've had some implementations that were three or four versions behind. And what we're gonna be doing is managing the life cycle of these APIs so that you just are dropping in a new, a new version of that pipe and yes, your vendor is going to have to support the new, the new functionality, but that pipe will be there and it's going to be available to you. Um, we have prioritized us, this by retailers and, and, and Ed certainly has had members of his team working with us on a weekly basis. Um, retailers were saying, look, and we got the message. If you're going to go back and tell me that I need to change the, uh, we're just going to change the XML connection to my price sign and make it an API, I'm not interested. I got real business challenges I got to deal with now 
Let's focus on those. Let's prioritize those. We always got time to clean up the stuff that works. We believe by doing the table stakes APIs in a centralized fashion and defined by retailers and then working with the vendors who are going, we're going to ask the vendors to actually write the APIs to our spec, test them, and contribute them to the API repository. We think we can get these APIs out in one-tenth the time with one-tenth the cost of the industry and with a standard at the end of it, which you'll never have with a bespoke project. So when we rewire the enterprise, we're kind of thinking about, look, the legacy system is, is what it is. It, it, we're not going to change the data typing, data standards in there. What we need to do is create this central nervous system that's above what we currently have. And that becomes kind of our future platform and a migration. So we're building these structured legacy data exchange APIs we're working with companies like the POS guys that you're dealing with, the back office guys that you're dealing with. We have 125 vendor members in Conexus. And if you're, if you're buying from them, they're probably our member. You just need to make sure that they understand that's what you want, right? And so we'll do these structured legacy APIs. And then once this brain is in place, that's where you start doing your innovation. You're not doing it at, at a mobile phone to point of sale connection. You're doing it through this enterprise nervous system. And it makes it a lot easier because if you're successful in making it mox nix that I've got Verifone and NCR and Passport and these other things out there, if that becomes abstracted, then it's the easiest thing to do. You're doing one layer of integration and pushing it out to these other, these other points of sale. Um, new partners. Think in terms of this. Um, and this is feedback I'm getting from a lot of the retailers considering this architecture. Three users in your systems, associates, suppliers, and customers. Yes, your customers may want to have enterprise access for some reason. We don't know. But three users, and they need to have varying levels of availability of data all the way across your enterprise stack. Today, what we say is uh, it's just a loyalty customer, and that's all we really need. You can't think that myopically. You've got to move like they, your customer is going to get deeper into your organization. New structured data APIs. We talked about IoT, and you're going to see a lot more IoT coming out consumer data, weather, and so forth. That's going to be coming from external sources. It's got to come through a standardized pipe. You want to do it, you want to change it to structure on the fly so that you're never buying or licensing a Hadoop database to go back and forensically do that. And then lastly, once we have the brain that's got all of this mass total of information three, four years down the road, then you're really doing some machine learning and a lot of predictive analytics. But you don't have to wait that long for the AI stuff. You can start getting into some deep statistics that allow you to start culling some benefits out right away. The collectivization, I call this the cost of chaos. We could all go out there and do our bespoke stuff, and we could ask our vendors to come out and do 30 versions of the same API uh, to integrate to my solution. And they'll do it, they'll hire the people, and you will pay the bespoke cost and you will pay for the maintenance costs, and you will pay the price of this system upgraded, but this system didn't. I need to make changes to that pipeline. What we're really trying to do here is take that cost off your back. We figure that if you do a one 100-day API, it's going to cost you about $50,000. They have two vendors right through that system and connect to each other. If those two vendors are non-compliant, but they're using a standard in between, that cost, if the standard from Conexus is in availability, that cost to you is down to around $13,000. But if all the vendors have already written that API just once, the cost to you then becomes materially zero because every vendor has already connected to every other vendor just by doing that connection once. So retailer cost for one API, Conexus is investing over a million bucks. We're actually partnering with the International Four Court Standards Forum in Europe. Here's the other benefit. It's going to be a global API suite. And so if somebody in China links something really cool into their point of sale that runs on the API rails, that same vendor from China now could come to the United States and be plugged into your operation using the same API. We've never been able to do that, and that's really kind of earth-shaking for us. Um, so we really think we can save 90% uh, of the cost in time to market. And really the motto here is better, faster, and cheaper. And that's what we should be providing. A quick note on that, you know, a number of years ago, we used to make a joke about what's the answer to any technology question? And the answer was put in the cloud. And that's not the answer. We're talking about cloud hybrid strategies. What can you process on the edge? But the new answer to any technology equation is build an API for it. And it's something that every organization can do, whether you're a one store chain or a 16,000 store chain. 
There are different ways to enter into this market, whether it's through Conexus or through your own DevOps team or through a fully managed service like MuleSoft. Uh, it's out there, it's accessible to everybody, and it's actually not that hard to implement. So for all of us, uh, we need to be in that game. Yep, I agree. So I want to leave, kind of exit out here on a cultural thing and get into some questions, but uh, this was from uh, Michael Gale in, in For Forbes last week on digitization, the psychology of di uh, digital transformation. And the drivers up here is really about innovation. Good idea in the organization, let's run with it, let's get it deployed. And the challenge is to be, to be clear on that is really disruption, the disruptor. So Jewel coming along saying, we're gonna do track and trace and limit. You know, regulatory can be disruptors. And so if you only use two of those circles and put them together, you're really kind of running blind. So let's say you take a really good idea, you get the investment behind it, you're blindly investing. In fact, you're running a big risk that doesn't even fit into a, 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 a comprehensive strategy. Or if you're taking a challenge uh, and you're mis mixing it with an investment, you have a really good chance of, you're not paying attention to the opportunities. Let's use EMV as an example. If you want to shortcut EMV and go out with just a very basic terminal out there, it'll cost you a lot less. But if your strategy has some drivers in it and says, you know what, that's a great opportunity for us to also push a kiosk out onto the island and some marketing, that is a driver. And what you end up doing is you get into the Zen zone. Well, this is the digital helix zone, according to him, which is you're using a blend of all times of, of disruption, innovation, and investment. And I think, I think we underinvest in technology. I don't know about you. Yeah, I think the investment piece tends to be the hardest one. I, uh, you know, from my experience, uh, we went out and benchmarked some big companies, big companies who are doing digital transformation. And uh, the spend is anywhere from 250 to $500 million annually over a period of a few years. So that's Spencer's, that's Starbucks, Marks and Spencer's, Starbucks. And I can tell you, you know, as McDonald's benchmarked that, they, they kind of fell in line with those expectations. We're certainly not investing $250 million into that space as an industry here. Uh, but we've got to figure out how more money gets into this. And so, you know, part of what we're doing is trying to raise awareness with our big supplier partners about uh, we're, not, we're not something to be ignored. We're not a small piece of the pie. We want to see more dollars coming into this channel. Uh, we all need a little bit of help with this investment piece. And, and for us in our own internal organizations, it's thinking about investments different. So if you use the Gartner Run, Grow, Transform, how are you taking money out of, of running and stabilizing the business and shifting it over to growing and transforming? And that's been a key focus for us in a place where we've unlocked some funds now to start to tap into this transformation space. That's a good point. I want to take a look at that. I think that that's something we should be driving on to the executives. Yep. Great. So key takeaways, we'll get into questions real quick. Pace technology, it's not going to slow down. It's actually going to accelerate to light speed. Legacy IT systems no longer work at that clock speed. And, but we need to protect them and, and get them to work that way. To thrive, we need to get our tech stack in order. And I mean thrive, not just survive, but thrive as well. Microservices offer that bridge from the legacy to the future. We need to collect and order all of our data. Digital should be a common cultural mentality and mindset. Start now, because cultures are tough to move. We need to, to uh, do test and learn uh, to get ROI of new technologies. So don't be afraid to try something. We should always be out there kicking the, the, the tires. Um, at that point, I'd like to open this up to questions. Um, anything about any technology, any questions about what our thinking was on, the, on this, um, what the bill, how the bills are gonna do at the end of the season, any question. Tim. I'll stay away from that one. Um, <laughs> My question is about the uh, technology divide in the C-Store industry. With over 150,000 some stores, what portion of them are keeping up with the technology roadmap that you've laid out there? And I'm particularly interested in what portion of them are succeeding without technology and how are they doing it? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you take a look at the, the SOI data, and I think you were at the SOI industry uh, meeting, there was a really cool study that was, here's, here's stores in 2019 and here's stores in 2009, and what made the difference between a really profitable store today versus back then? And what we saw was food service. Those stores that did food service became much more profitable stores. That was the takeaway. Food service was the key. If you stayed with gas, cokes, and smokes, you're, you're kind of treading water. And I think we're at the same we're at the same juxtaposition with with technology. And I think EMV is going to be a big washout moment. If you listen to Linda's EMV. Um, uh, presentation. There's about 10% of the market that can't justify, can't pay for EMV out of operating cash flows. They just don't have it. 
And that's a technology, that's, a, that's one of those disruptors that came in and said, hey, you have got to do this or you're gonna suffer this risk. And I think that's gonna really drive home those who can and those who can't. Um, but again, I think, you know, to Ed's point, this can be done by any company, but you have to sit down and take the time to say, what is it we wanna do over the next three to five years, regardless of size, and get serious about it and make some investments and do some, some low stake bets to bring you ahead. And that's what I don't see happening in the industry. I hear too many times, oh, we're too small to do that. Well, if you look at Quick Check, Quick Check's 45 stores, they're doing scan and go. They're doing loyalty. They're doing ACH. You don't have to be a huge chain to, to innovate. And sometimes I got to believe it's an inhibitor to have this huge footprint and then have to change a battleship versus a, a speedboat. It's hard to turn a big ship around. Yeah, I can say from us, we've merger and acquisition is our growth model uh, in that we pick up, you know, different levels of technology maturity. Uh, and they're all at disparate places. And, you know, my vision, the vision that we have for the organization is that we abstract all that complexity, API driven architecture, microservices to abstract those endpoints. So no matter where you are in your in your legacy your retirement journey, uh, you can layer on new services, loyalty, digital, you know, et cetera. So, um, it's, you know, it's different for every organization, but the key is that strategy, the vision, and then taking that first step into that world. Yep. I think that's really going to be the deciding factor. EMV is going to throw us off our balance. Yep. I think it's, it's sucking up a lot of innovation dollars. Any other questions? We have three. David? If you ask me about the API sprint, I'm, then I'm going to lose confidence in that. No, I, I actually just have, want to make, Ed, it's great to see you. I heard you were sending a hologram. I'm go, uh, glad to see it's really you up there. <laughs> How <laughs> so, do you know? <laughs> I don't. Artificial <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> so the first point is uh, CI, CD, or integration and deployment continually. Um, you mentioned, and this isn't a question, I'm just reinforcing what you said. Develop, Developer-centric application programming environments are essential to our success. If we write these things badly, they lose interest, they move on, they find another job. If you, if you do a really good job on creating that environment so they can do what they need to do and they think it's cool, they'll keep doing it. I'm speaking as the guy in the room who used to write the assembly language code. That model doesn't work anymore, right? I had to jettison it from my personality. I what, what's assembly language? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's what's in the IKEA instruction. <laughs> Without the pictures. <laughs> right. So my question is, now everybody's going to groan, data governance. I think you mentioned it. it. It gives me a headache to think about it. All of the various aspects of this data, some of which are totally benign you know, by itself, and then if you mix it with something else, it suddenly becomes a little more risky. Um, and also using blockchains to create contracts to control data governance, because you're not going to be able to sit down in a boardroom and figure out who should see what data when. I'm just wondering if, if this is on your roadmap. Gosh. No. And in fact, it was brought up yesterday as a, as a great idea. I think we had somebody say, look, how do you, if you're dumping all your data to a vendor, how do you make sure that the data is used in your best interest and not against you and or in an inappropriate fashion? So. Um, and in fact, Juul is a great example. Uh, last night at dinner, somebody told me that in some states, Juul isn't taking uh, merchandise that's been pulled from the shelves back. Um, and Wawa just got sued as a co-defendant for Juul in Florida. And so what is, the, what, is, what is the contractual relationship with the supplier on liability there? So I think from a data governance perspective, we got a lot to look at. And unfortunately, we're gonna have to bring in some lawyers. It, it seems like the thing that is almost uh, an afterthought as we talk about transformation and modernization of the tech stack and people and culture, data is one of those last things that we get to and everybody goes, I don't know how to solve this problem. Who does it sit with? How do we manage it? What's the governance? So uh, we've got to figure out a way to bring that to the forefront and start with data first. And I said before, POS today is the most important part of the equation. It should be data that's the most important part of the equation in, in all of our tech stacks. I agree. Any other questions? You mentioned the API being potentially a global initiative, but the U.S. is so far behind all the other countries of the world, U.S., Europe, and the others. Why would they adopt a, an API from us? Actually, they're not. Um, actually, when you take a look at what's going on in Europe, um, it's, it's very much in line with us. 
And the opportunity when you look at developing markets, like uh, I spent an hour and a half with the uh, CEO of Philippine 7-Eleven, uh, who's doing some amazingly cool stuff on the mobile front. But there's a huge amounts of opportunity for them to leapfrog us by getting into APS because they haven't done this integration yet. So it's highly decentralized data. They're not doing a lot of know your customer. They're not doing, only 30% of the people in the Philippines even have a bank account. So it's a very cash-based business. So they look at what we're doing and say, hey, I wanna go to school on your putt. I don't wanna replicate what you've done. So in developing markets, I think we, we have a future for them. Um, and I think for the, the developed markets in North America and Europe, I think we're stuck in the same quagmire of legacy systems and we can lift those. You look at markets like Australia, there we probably have less of an appeal because they've been kind of moving separately um, and, and, and along. So there are markets that aren't gonna find this as valuable, but um, I think every market will be able to, of the 32 APIs that David, the team's been able to identify, you'll be able to pick up 10 or 15 that are gonna make sense. And listen, steal, steal shamelessly, right? Um, it's, we're, we have a global footprint. We're able to borrow some of the best practices from our, our stores in Europe. But Connexus gives you a forum to leverage what's happening at a global scale at a local level. So we're not too proud to say we have to develop this ourselves. We can go out and find best in class from around the globe, bring that into this organization, and then share it back with the smaller organizations. In fact, that's one of our mantras, right? I mean, um, the mantra is this. The future is here, it's just unevenly distributed. Yep. Okay, we have gone over our time. One more, Danny. Hi, um, with the high level of breaches happening in the industry with personal identifiable information, shouldn't the industry move faster in regards to loyalty and payment and, and using blockchain technology? To yes. prevent that. <laughs> so in your map, you said th three years. Shouldn't it be like starting now? So when we look at that, the, the, the problem we have is, is the digital trust element of it. So um, let's just take age verification, which is a very hot topic, and we're going to be working on this very much when we work with the World Wide Web Consortium on it. Right now, we've got tokenized standards that are in place that, that are in open source wallets and can be used, and, and FIDO agrees with them and so forth. But that's a single use attribute of an identity. As we start adding on more attributes, like what's my loyalty program, now it becomes a blockchain. But if it's just, hey, am I over 21? We can probably do that best with just a, a token. But now I'm over 21 and I'm part of your loyalty program, or here's some other stuff and I wanna join your loyalty program. I think that's where blockchain comes into play. We're working with a guy named Alan Brown. He's our representative to ANSI X9. Um, he's a PhD from MIT uh, in AI, and he thinks AI is bull, and so he went into blockchain. And he's actually uh, working with them on how we can replace SWIFT with blockchain in the financial market. So we've got some good folks looking at it, and I agree with you, Danny. It's, it, it's going to solve a lot of problems down the road. It, it's a great question. It's a... Uh you know, it, it's an action item that we take away is we've talked about it a lot. How do we start doing something about it? And, and I think we, we've got to get past the talk and that's, that's pretty much, you know, I feel like all it's been so far. So we, we've,